Uh, we're in a collection of talks called Life in Rhythm. And it's really around the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And often we love that Jesus is our salvation, that he died on our cross for us, that he is the truth, everything he says we love, but we often forget he's the way. That the way he did life, the way he worked, the way he rested, the way he did relationships, we got to model that. He didn't just die as our substitute, he lived, listen, as our example. And every week we've been talking about something we don't normally talk about. Two weeks ago it was about work. Last week was about community. And today is simply this, it is rest. What does God look like when he shows up in your calendar? It's not a sexy sermon, but it's going to convict you. And normally I'm going to do what I normally do best. I'm going to make you laugh, and I'm going to teach you God's word. And if you're ready, someone say amen. Let me, if you can bow your heads and close your eyes, let me just pray real quick. Thank you, Jesus, for your word that is sharper than any, any active sword, God. It cuts to the heart, Lord. God, there are a lot of books that we read. The Bible is the only book that reads us. It shows us where we need to change. God, often we long to hear your voice. And we realize when we read your word, we've heard your voice. God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. We don't want to just come in for a TED Talk. We didn't just come to hear some good things, God. We came to be transformed and changed into the likeness of Jesus. We walked in one way, God, but we want to walk out another. We want to love like you. We want to talk like you. We want to look like you. And people believe that. Everybody said? Everybody said? Let me just highlight some changes I've made in the last couple of weeks. If you notice, we got Javi up here. Can we give it for Javi? Yeah. And normally I preach with a headset, but I, I want to go back to my old Baptocostal roots where I preach with a handset. And some of you work out with gym music. This is my spiritual music right now. This is me working out. So let me be me because I preach better with this in the background. Uh, 1910, a man by the name of, of Hyman Fried, Friedman was born. And he was a cardiologist, and he was studying patients in America for the last hundred years, and he recognized Americans are dying young. There's this common symptom. They are stressed out. They're 30, 40, 50 years old, and they're dying of heart disease. No other culture, no other nation has these problems. And he invented, if you've heard this before, the Myers-Briggs test. And Myers, he understood that that most people who are dying young from heart disease, they're type A people. He, he was the one that coined that term. And he, in, he defined this clinical sickness. It's called hurry sickness. And it's defined as this, a feeling of constantly rushing. A feeling where we're always behind and the pressured sense that there's never enough time. Now listen, you don't need to put your hand up. Uh, I just want you to, I'm going to read some examples of uh, hurry sickness. And listen, if your spouse has these, you are more than welcome to elbow them in the name of Jesus right now, okay? This is one of those sermons. I need, I need your help because maybe your spouse doesn't know they have this issue, and maybe you both have it, but at the end, I'm going I'm to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to read some of these to you. You might have a hurry sickness. Listen, if you are coming to a stoplight, and there's two lanes, and in the distance, you begin to count the cars in each lane. And you go, there's three in that one and five in this one, and you switch lanes. And you're a psychopath. Listen, if you start looking at the age of the driver and the make and model of the car, that's when you know you got crazy hurried sickness. Don't raise your hand. You can elbow them, though. Second one, if you have a hurry sickness, you're shopping at Target, and there are two checkout lines. And you count the number of people in line, and you go to the shortest line. Then here's another one. This is where you know you're really, really crazy. The lines are equal. And then you pick one. And then you count where you'd be in that line if you stayed in that line. If you're new to church, that's nervous laughter, by the way. There's a lot of crazy people in the room. The last one, if you have hurried sickness, is when you type in the address in your phone, it gives you estimated time of arrival. But because you're sick, you read time to beat. And now it becomes a race. I can beat that. Now, show of hands if you're honest. You, you have any of those symptoms in your life. Y'all are sick. Y'all are sick. Uh, I'm going to quickly transition to something very heavy. Is that cool? There's a book, two books that I read this last year that really impacted my life. I take a picture of these books. These books are Take the Day Off by a man named Robert Morris and The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Montgomery. And uh, in, in the book, Take the Day Off, there's an excerpt that I want to read to you that is just shocking to me. 
uh, the, a report submitted to the government of Japan simply called him Mr. A. To protect his identity, let's call him Mr. Asago. He worked for several years at a major Japanese snack food processing company, often putting, listen, in as many as 110 hours each week. To put that in perspective, that's more than two and a half 40-hour weeks jammed into one. To log 110 hours in a week, listen, requires working nearly 16-hour days, seven days a week. This young man did that week after week, year after year, until they found Mr. Osago dead at his workstation. The victim of a heart attack. He was 34 years old. Now, you might think that's extreme, but let me tell you that what Friedman Myers found in America, other countries are also experiencing. It's just workaholism. Now, we are sick with our hurriness, and it's literally killing us. In Japanese culture, they have this word, it's called Kuroshi. In China, they have this other word. I'm not even trying to pronounce it. It's that word. In South Korea, it's this word. And they literally had to invent these words in the last 50 years to describe a new phenomenon of young people dying because they're overworked. They're working too much. And the symptoms are, you're working long hours under intense pressure with little to no rest. And here's the question I want to ask some workaholics, some sick people in the room. Because you came to Silicon Valley for a reason. You came here to hustle for a dream. The second gold rush. The first one was gold. The second one's tech. What is God's plan to keep us refreshed? Because it's so easy, listen, to live in this valley and then work like this valley. What is God's plan for our life? And the solution, let me just tell you, is a simple word. It's the word Shabbat. It's a Hebrew word. It's English, it means Sabbath. That's God's solution. And I want to be a professor this morning and just kind of teach you a little bit of what this word means. And there's going to be some convictions. I, I expect you to walk out this room going, I need to cut some things out of my life. The whole point of this talk is not for you to listen to a TED talk. That's cute. No, no, no. You walk out, your calendar changes. Because God wants your soul to be refreshed. And the first one, if you're taking notes, is simply this. The Sabbath is a command. Someone say command. For those of you that are biblically astute there, in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, God gives the, his people something very valuable. Ten tweetable lines. Now, I know it's called Twitter, now it's called X, but if you could take the, the basic Christian doctrine, Christian, Christian ethics call this the basic morality of Christianity. It's the Ten Commandments. And there are these ten things that God really wants us to do. They're that important. We often forget number four. It's on your screen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath. Someone say Sabbath. I'm going to say it one more time. Someone say Sabbath. If you're new to our church, our tribe, we're a loud church. Help me preach this message. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's the Hebrew word, kadosh. When the angels surround God in the throne room of God, they are singing, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And this word means to be separate, to be set apart from everything else. Work is one thing, but the Sabbath is separate from those normal things. Six days you shall labor. Do your email, do your Zoom calls, and do all your work. But on the Sabbath, next verse, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall turn off your cell phone and do no work. It's prophecy right there. You, your son, your daughter, and your male servants, none of my servants work on the Sabbath either. Or your male servants, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. I find it remarkable that God, in the same category as murder and adultery, puts Sabbath. That we don't equate those two things as the same. That we have a category, oh, I'll never do those things. I'll never lie. I'll never steal. I'll never murder. But Sabbath, come on, everybody breaks that. Uh, it's crazy that, that in God's mind, murder is the same as Sabbath. See, Many people, when they want to meet with Pastor myself or my wife, they go, Pastor Allen, I need to meet with you. I, I always begin with, hey, on Fridays, that's my Sabbath. I can't meet. That's the only day I can meet Pastor Allen. We have to meet. And I always, I love responding to this way. I'm like, hey, after we meet, are you okay with robbing a bank? No, no, no. Look, 
Let's, let's kill the barista if they don't make the coffee perfect. How about we swap wives? And you know, I'm just kidding, by the way. But normally I say those things because I'm, I'm telling them, you would never ask me to murder someone, so why are you asking me to work on the Sabbath? See, in our minds, this is optional. Those are the moral things we got to do. This is something we can do whenever we feel like it, but not in God's mind. The Sabbath, listen, is not a suggestion. It's a command. And listen, when you don't do it, yes, it is sin. It's crazy, because we don't look at it that way. And some of you are like a little bit theologically astute. You go, Pastor Ali, that's Old Testament though. And you're right. But I want to show you in a second that the, the law was given 1,500 years before the Mosaic law. That the Sabbath was actually a law of creation. And listen, it was codified in the law, and then Jesus did it. See, often we, we want to accept the truths of Christianity. We just don't want to live Christianity. We want Jesus as the truth, but we don't want to live his way. I wrote like this, the devil's okay with you accepting the truth of Christianity without the habits of Christianity. What's the point of believing he's the savior of the world, but then not living how we told you to live? This isn't the Sabbath suggestion. It's the commandment, which leads me to point number two. It's this, Sabbath is a law of creation. See, I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter two. This is 1,500 years before Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. This one, though, he records this this beautiful conversation. And I hope that you see this because when you see what I'm about to tell you, your mind's going to be blown. Some of you, you build your identity on what you do for God, not who you are in God. Genesis chapter 2 says this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Someone say finished. And all the hosts of them. He had made Nemo, Simba, Free Willy, all those dudes. He made all of them. And on the seventh day, someone say seventh day. God finished his work that he had done, and he rested. Someone say rested. Rested. Let me just pause right there. God is three things. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent. Which means God is all-knowing, he's everywhere, and he's all-powerful. There are some of you in this room, you love working out. Like, you got biceps for days. I have the body of a 12-year-old. We're the same. But if we both picked up five-pound weights, we can both knock out 100. But eventually, you're going to outlast me. And you're going to get to 200, 300, maybe get to four or five, and then you're going to get tired because you're going to feel the burn. How many curls does God have to do before he gets tired? He doesn't. So why is the God who never gets tired resting? Because he's not doing it for him. There's a person there that he's doing it for. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he was done, even though the guy that doesn't get tired is right. Watch. So God blessed this. It's a blessing for you. He don't need the Sabbath. You and I do. So he blessed the Sabbath and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done. I need to show you this picture. This is like not very graphic design, but it's something that I try to do. On day six, next slide, Adam is created. His first day is not a day of work. Normally in our culture, we rest, we work, 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 and then we rest. Notice the order in which Adam does life. Day seven is his first day alive. He Sabbaths. Day eight is actually day two. Then he works. For some of you in this room, you get your identity. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a CEO. I'm an executive. Before Adam even had an opportunity to call himself the CEO of Eden, he was the son of God. That you have to be known by him before you work for him. Some of you in this room, you work for an identity instead of receiving one. The highest calling of my life is not to be a pastor, but to be a son. And some of you, you're working and working and hustling and you forget that you were, before you were created to work, you were created to be in a relationship with God. And I get people all the time, push back, push back, push back. Pastor Ali, the devil never rests. Well, why is the devil your role model? Like, isn't the whole point of this book that we're not supposed to follow him? 
Maybe it shows that you're a disciple of someone else other than Jesus. Maybe you're learning how to work from Elon Musk and Gary Vee and that grind it hustle culture, not kingdom culture. Because they'll tell you to work at all costs. And God says, I want you to work for six days and then stop. Even if all of your friends aren't, I want you to stop. It's going to be hard. Because listen, the thing about the, the Sabbath, it is woven into creation. And when you go against, in the same way that if I were to drop something, it's going to fall. When you don't Sabbath, it's going to hurt you. H.H. H. Farmer, he's a pastor and theologian. He says this, when you go against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. I love that. I get people all the time, Pastor Al, you, don't, you don't understand. I'm a D on the Myers-Briggs. I'm type A. I, I'm not built to rest. Adam rested. No, 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 Pastor Al, you don't understand. I'm a tech executive. Uh, like, I, I, I work a lot. Yeah, Adam was the CEO of the, the greatest company called Eden. Literally expanding the kingdom of heaven. You're building a tech company. He was expanding the kingdom. His job was way more crazy than yours. And he was the only employee. What's your excuse? Even he rested. And then I hear this from some moms all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom, Pastor Alley. It's the hardest job ever. Shout out to all the moms who stay home. Shout out to the single moms who raise kids. God bless you. And there's this idea, no, no, you're, I don't have time, even though you need a rest. Here's the question. Where do we get the seven-day work week from? Why isn't it five? Why isn't it ten? Like, if you look at our calendar, it's way better to build our calendar based on the sun, like the solar or lunar calendar. But it's not. For seven, we pick seven days. Why? Because that everyone knows that when you work seven days, a work week, it works better. It comes from Judeo-Christian values. Even the culture that don't even believe in Jesus, they still have seven-day work weeks. And when you don't work this way, you hurt yourself. Let me give you four examples of this. In the French Revolution, about 250 years ago, that the French eliminated the seven-day work week and they implemented a 10-day work week. You think they'd have success. Only three things happened. The economy crashed, suicide went up, and everyone was less productive than before. Why? Because when you don't work God's way, you hurt yourself. Study after study is showing you, no matter how much caffeine you take, whether it's pre-workout or four shots of espresso because you're crazy, whether you're a labor worker or behind a computer, after 50 hours, your productivity plummets, which is so fascinating to me because if you work eight-hour days, six days a week, that's 48 hours. After that, it goes down. That's not by accident, by the way. If you look at American history, when the settlers, when the pioneers were going west for the Oregon Trail, you know the settlers that got to the West Coast first were the ones that Sabbath every seven days before those that never rested. And then you take the Old Testament. There are only four things that God says, if you do that, you deserve death. It's like, ooh, Jesus, that's kind of psycho. Some of them make sense, though. If you sleep with another person's wife, adultery, off with his head. You kill someone else. Not, not, this is like murder, like premeditated, gone. The third one's going to shock some of you when you have rebellious kids. I was all, there all the time during COVID. I'm like, Lord, take them right now. <laughs> but the idea is not that they're rebellious once, that they're continuously rebellious and they're never repenting of it. God literally said, if you don't Sabbath, you deserve death. And that, that shocks us. Why? God, aren't you a tyrant? Because you don't realize you're going to get splinters. I wrote it like this. Maybe this will help you. When you continue to break the Sabbath, you're killing yourself slowly. There's a group of sociologists that were studying different people groups in America. And they wanted to find out who are the happiest people in America. And they found this one small Christian sect. They're very strange, by the way. They're very religious. They're called Seventh-day Adventists. And they worship God on Saturday, whereas we worship God on Sunday. Because they still believe in the Mosaic law. Uh, they, they still abide by it. They, they're very religious. But the sociologists discovered that these people are the happiest people in America. And... They live on average 11 years. Someone say 11 years. 11 years. I'm going to come back to that, why it's so important. They live 11 years longer than the average American. Now, I want to try to show you this as much as I can. And I, we tried to put it on the screen, too. Um, but if, you, if I take the average American, live 77 years old. You can look on the screen right here. There are how many days in a year? 365. So I multiply this by 365. I get 28,000. 
105 days. That's how many days on average you're going to live. I've already lived 14,000. I've got 12,000 more. It's kind of morbid, but that's the truth. But if I take 28,000 and divide it by seven, that's how many Sabbath days I'm going to give God. If I obey everything. How many years is that? i got to divide that by now 365. What am I left with? 11. Some of you went to public school, you have no idea what I just did. <laughs> so let me, let me explain this. When the seventh day of Venice, regardless of their motive, they're obviously obeying God out of fear. But the average seventh day of Venice, watch. They work six days, and then they Sabbath one. And every time they give God one, God adds a day to their life. It's not that God's going to take away these years. He's not a God that's going to curse you. But when you trust him by faith, he will bless you. And when you trust him, as crazy as this sounds, this is number three, the Sabbath, listen, it teaches you to walk by faith. That's the point of it. It's not just a blessing. It's meant to train you that even when I work, I need God in my work. Some of you, the only time you connect with God is in this room. He wants to be there in your office. He wants to be when you're out in the field. Whatever you do, God wants to go there with you. And the very first time God actually implements the Sabbath or commands his people to do it is actually not Exodus chapter 20. It's Exodus chapter 16. To understand the context, the people of Israel had been in slavery for 400 years. And they have just been rescued. And now they're in the middle of the wilderness. A million people. There's no Whole Foods. There's no DoorDash. Even Apu no Hapas even Penelon is not out there. Apu. There's no Quickie Mart in the middle of nowhere. How do you feed a million people when there's no Safeway? What's God going to do? What God does is he feeds them himself. He rains bread from heaven. So let me show you this verse to you. This is Exodus chapter 16, verse 21. Morning by morning, they gathered it as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. You got to understand that, that the, the people of God, that they'd wake up and there'd be food on the ground already for them. And then by faith, what they do is they collect all the food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you didn't, by noon, it, would, it was gone. Next verse. On the sixth day, they gather twice. Some will say twice. twice. Twice as much. God wants to teach you. For the first five days, you collect for that day. But on the sixth day, I want you to collect food for that day and the next day. Watch why. And when twice as much bread to Omer. Someone say Omer's. This is Omer, not Homer. This is a measure of, this is a unit of measurement, not dope. Now, half of you don't get this joke because you didn't have a good childhood. We'd love to pray for your trauma as a little kid after service. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest. He's telling them on day six what tomorrow is going to happen. A holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left us over, lay aside to keep till morning. Listen, the number one reason why I see people don't Sabbath is they don't prepare. You got to prepare to have the Sabbath. And lazy, undisciplined people, they never experience Sabbath. They never do. It gets even crazier. Next verse. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Same hope I have every time I eat out at a restaurant. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. He just told them what is happening. And watch what the people of God do. Six days you, will, you shall gather up on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath. There will be none. On the seventh day, some of the Laker fans went out to gather. Because you know they're evil. But they found none. Let me just kind of warn you, prophetically. You can work on the Sabbath. God just won't work with you. You can go to work, but he won't be there. That's what this is saying. You can go, but I'm not there. Next verse. 
And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you a Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Chill out. Relax. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. We're going to ask this question. Why does God want us to do this? It's got a, a cosmic killjoy. He's just like a, a judge that like wants to like get angry if you don't listen to what he says. He's a father. And he wants his kids who are stressed out, overworked, and have no rest to experience what the culture is not experiencing. When you look at the Old Testament, God often creates what are called kosher dietary laws. And it's like very strange. I don't want you to eat this food. I want you to eat that food. Why? Because if you live God's way, you are healthy in the rest of the culture. And there's a way our culture works that literally will kill you. Because our culture values money more than God. Our culture values clout and how big your Instagram is and how many employees you have and how much is in your bank account. And God's like, man, am I in your home? God is saying these things not because he wants to withhold anything, because he has something for you. But it takes faith to believe that. Especially in a culture, because I have friends, man, they, I was in the tech industry, I had, I had a friend in high school who, who would work a 40-hour week like I did, and then, because he was so driven to be successful, he started another startup, and he'd work on that startup every day from 5 to 10 p.m. He did it for three years. And he'd make me feel guilty for not getting ahead like him. And there's this fear, if I don't work like that, I won't get ahead. I wrote like this, the Sabbath forces you to trust God works when you don't. It takes faith. One of the most common phrases in the New Testament is the righteous shall live by faith. Book of Romans, book of Galatians, book of Hebrews, the righteous will live by faith because it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith doesn't just save you, it changes you. It takes faith to trust God to forgive your enemies. It takes faith to die for your wife when you feel like she doesn't deserve it. It takes faith to give God your finances when I feel better when I have 100%. Sabbath is the same way. I wrote like this, you can get more done in six days with the blessing of God than you can with seven without him. And yet many of you don't believe that, which is why you don't Sabbath. Can I tell you a story of one example Hopefully this convinces you that it does and it can work. There's this one restaurant, and maybe this room, you know, think about this restaurant six days a week. And then you walk out this room, you're like, oh my God, I want to eat there. But it's closed. What place is that? Somebody shout out loud. Chick-fil-A. Jesus chicken. Right? There are almost every Sunday, I, I get in my car, I'm like, you know what? I need a spicy chicken sandwich, extra pickles, and a peach milkshake, yet talk about it. But it's literally a curse from hell that it's closed. But Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, as the prophet Kanye says, right? <laughs> False prophet, maybe, I don't know. But let me give you four statistics about Chick-fil-A. It's the second largest fast food chain in America. It's the fastest growing fast food chain in America. It's the most profitable fast food chain in America. And survey after survey shows it's America's favorite restaurant. Fastest growing, most profitable, second largest, and they're closed on Sunday. How in the world? Only God. Only God. I wrote like this. The Sabbath is to your schedule what the tithe is to your finances. It takes faith to trust God with your money. In the same way, it's going to take faith to trust him in your calendar. And it works. Now, maybe some of you are convinced. You're like, Pastor Alex, okay, you've got me. It's a command. It's the law of creation. I, I, I'm believing, you know, Pastor Alex, that this is for me. But I often get these three questions. What about an emergency, Pastor Alex? What about an emergency? Well, Jesus answered this. He said this in Luke 14. Suppose your child or ox fell into a ditch on the Sabbath. What do I do? Get him out. 
Unless it's a cat, leave it in. <laughs> Second question I often get, what day of the week, Pastor Ali? What day of the week? Because I heard yours is on Friday. But I, I got to work on Fridays. What, what day can I pick? Because in the Old Testament, you didn't get the option of picking. It was Saturday for everyone. Actually, that's why in American culture, we have two days off. The Jews get Saturday off. The Christians get Sunday. You're welcome for giving you a two-day work weekend. But Romans chapter 14, verse 5 says this. One person esteems one day as better than the other, while the other esteems all days alike. Each one, someone say each one, should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, the day being the Sabbath day, observes it in honor of the Lord. So maybe Sunday for you is the Sabbath day, but there are some of us that got to work on Sunday. <laughs> Last question. This one's always fun. Pastor, what do you do? Oh my, what do you do on the Sabbath? And it comes from this idea that, like, I feel like I'm wasting the day. And the fact that you're asking the question reveals you actually need the Sabbath more than you realize. Because you feel like a, it's a waste of a day if you don't do something with it. And before Adam worked, he spent one day with God. Because God wanted to remind him the value that you bring is not the work you do in the garden, but who loves you. Which brings me to point number four. The Sabbath is a blessing. Someone say blessing. blessing. I need to show you this because this is so powerful. This is Jesus. He, he's observing the Sabbath. He, he didn't just teach this principle. He lived this principle. And often we, we forget that God's a good father. And when he gives good gifts, they're meant to bless us, not burden us. They're meant to add to our life, not take away from our life. And in Matthew chapter 2, watch what happens. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some of the grains, the heads of grain. Now, let me just tell you, in the Old Testament, there are like over 600 rules in the Mosaic Law. None of them say you can't eat on the Sabbath. Actually, in my family, Sabbath is the best day of the week. Kids, take out my kids to ice cream. We eat whatever we want because I want my kids to realize that God is a good God. And so on Sabbath, we're celebrating the goodness of God, eating whatever we want. Taco Bell, just want to tell my wife, awesome. <laughs> so what Jesus is doing is not bad. The Bible says don't work on the Sabbath. It doesn't say don't eat on the Sabbath. But watch what religious people do. They always take God's blessings and they make them burdens. Watch this. The Pharisees, someone say the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? What they were doing was not unlawful. So you got to understand the, the backstory to what's actually happening. God wrote this Bible. All scriptures God breathed. But what happened is the Pharisees, these guys are like super duper religious. Like think Ned Flanders and the, the Simpsons. Like these are those guys. Oakley, Doakley, everywhere they go. And they want to help Christians follow Jesus. So they wrote another book called the Mishnah. And literally, there are thousands of commands in that book to tell you how to follow this one. So take the fourth commandment, which is Sabbath. There were literally over, listen, 500 rules on how to follow the Sabbath in your life. God didn't write any of those, by the way. Man did. And one of those rules that man wrote was don't pick the head of grain. And they're coming to Jesus saying, bro, didn't you read the Bible? And this flex that Jesus does is like epic. Have you never read the book? That No one cares about your book, bro. Have you? And that's, let me tell you why it's a flex. Because these men, the Pharisees, they memorized the first five books of the Bible at the age of 12. Their entire life was devoted to memorizing. So when Jesus is saying, bro, have you read? He's, he's almost, let me modernize this. McFly. Did you fall on your head as a little kid? McFly. He's flexing on them. You read, but you don't understand. You search the scriptures, hoping in them that you find life, and they all point to me. You've, have you never read what David did when he went and he and his companions were hungry and in need? Next verse. In the, day of, in the days of 
Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is unlawful for only priests to eat. And he also gave some of it to his companions. And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for the Sabbath. Amen. So the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. See, what religious people do is take the blessings of God, the gifts of God, and they make them burdens. I wrote it like this. Maybe this will make more sense to you. You don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves you. Some of you, you don't need to be afraid of this thing. This thing is a gift. It's a blessing. I remember I have a pastor friend who tries to visit Israel every four to five years. And the very first time he was there, he was learning the culture. He had forgotten because it was a Saturday. That was normally his day off. So he's out and about in the city and like nothing's working. No one, no one's open. He finally gets into an elevator and there's all these other Jews in with him inside the elevator. And he notices all the buttons are already pressed. He's like, oh my God. Some sicko pushed all the buttons. And he goes up to the first floor and no one gets out. Goes up to the second floor and he, he like loses his mind. He's like, God, like why, why is this happening? And just like, oh, this is a Shabbat elevator. He's like, what? Yeah, this is a Sabbath elevator. We're not allowed to do work on Saturday. And the Old Testament says you can't build fire. And if you push a button, that closed electrical circuit, that's a New Testament way of making fire, so we can't push the button. So all of these elevators stop at every floor. He goes, is there a Gentile elevator somewhere? Like, this is crazy. (laughs) And there was. He goes across the hall. So this guy walks out of the elevator. As he walks in, he realizes all these Jews are following him. He's like, what do you want? He's like, we want to go to the seventh floor. Can you push number seven for us? <laughs> and that's what happens when you take God's blessing and you twist it. And that's a burden. And what's supposed to make your life better and what's supposed to refresh you becomes another rule, another checklist the yoke on your shoulders that makes life even harder. I mean, we can laugh, but imagine living like that. I often get asked this question, Pastor Ali, on the Sabbath, what don't I do? The word Sabbath is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which literally means to stop or to rest. Probably the best piece of advice I can give you is if you just turn this off for eight hours, your life will be different. On those days, I, I don't answer phone calls. I don't do emails. I try not to. My wife and I block that time off. When people ask, I already have something on the calendar. I, it's extended time of devotion to God. Often, I'm just with my wife and kids. There's different seasons. I do different things. When, when, when my wife and I had two small kids at home, we would take turns. Uh, you need to go on a prayer walk. You, need, you, you go do this. Now our kids are in school on Fridays. My wife and I spend our Sabbaths together. We, we work out. We, we go to coffee shops. It's less about what I'm doing as a pastor and more what I'm doing as a son. And that's the power of Sabbath because it's so easy to be so caught up in your work that you forget what your greatest calling is. I've talked about this before, but this last year, God really healed me of my anger. I used to yell at my kids every day. Some of you are judging me. That's okay. We'd love to bring you up here. <laughs> it's called being passive aggressive, by the way. But God, my wife and I was a prayer for a year, and he, he began to change me. I remember asking my kids, just trying to like probe, how much did I hurt my kids? Because who you are affects them. I remember asking my girls, hey, does dad love you? And they're eating breakfast one time. This is like January. They're like, yeah. I'm like, does dad love you even when you don't listen? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, does dad love you even when he gets angry and yells at you? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, wow, I didn't damage him too much, right? (laughs) And I'm like, why? Why does dad love you? And they just said a simple, your dad. See, it's so easy to be Adam, be a CEO, be a tech executive, and you work, work, work. Sabbath reminds you what work causes you to forget. Your greatest calling is to be a son and daughter of God. And your value, the reason why God loves you. Let me just speak to all the Christians in the room. God doesn't love you because you come to church. God doesn't love you because you read your Bible. 
Let me go a little deeper. God doesn't love you because you obey him. He loves you because he's your dad. So take a Sabbath in the name of God. You can bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you that you're a heavenly father that wants the best for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the revelation, God, that this Sabbath is not an optional thing. It's the thing that adds life and value to me, God. God, forgive me, Lord, that I have a different category for murder and theft than I do for Sabbath. God, remind me that it's the law of creation, that I was created to be with you before I was created to work for you. Lord, teach me, God, that there's value in the Sabbath to remind me that it doesn't all depend on me, that the Sabbath takes faith, Lord, let me not turn like the Pharisees this gift, this blessing into a burden. This is a time to just speak with God. Don't let this be a TED talk. Don't let just God show up in your finances. Let him show up in your calendar as well. Let him speak to you. Holy Spirit, reveal how we need to change our life, our habits, our rhythms. We're not called to live like everyone else in Silicon Valley. And it's not enough for us to know the truth of Christianity. We need the habits of Christianity. There are others of you in this room. I need to tell you that the antidote to hurry sickness is not self-care. I know that's the largest book section in every Amazon, every Barnes and Nobles. Do this for self-help. Do that for self-help. The, the greatest thing that you need is forgiveness of sin. And you can be, live on an island vacation, sit on a beach, and it will never be enough to give rest to your soul. Because you need to be right with God. The Bible says that the wage of sin is death. There is a separation between you and the living God. The God who created you, who wants to walk with you who wants to do life with you. Before you do anything for him, he did everything for you. He left heaven 2,000 years ago and entered human history, fully God, fully man. His name was Jesus. And this Jesus lived a sinless and perfect life. He gave us what we could never give God, a person who lived in perfect righteousness. Then he did what not all of us deserve. He dies in our place as a substitute. And when you become a Christian, It's not about you doing anything. It's about you placing your faith in what he did for you, the work that he did for you. Because when you receive his work on the cross, you can receive the rest of salvation. With every eye closed and every head bowed. If that's you, you just feel this tug on your heart, that you're weary, you're tired, You've done life the Silicon Valley way. And you feel like God's drawn you to this church and you feel like, yes, I need Jesus. I want to count to three. I want you to shoot your hand up. I'd love to pray for you. You're not saying yes to me or this church. You're saying yes to the living God. Every eye closed, every head bowed. One, two, three. Shoot your hand up if that's you. Shoot your hand up if that's you. Amen. 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 I want everyone to pray this out loud. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving heaven for me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sin. Lord, I turn from my sin. Turn from my ways. Turn from my habits. And I follow you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for another chance. As much as I understand now, I want to follow you all the days of my life. And everybody said, can we give up for the hands that went up this morning? Can you, as we continue our worship experience, can I get you to stand up real quick? I want to challenge some of you in this room with this connect card. We put these on your chair for a reason because... I know some of you filled them out to pray for someone, but for, for many of you in this room, this is your first time at church. And God has been speaking to you. God's been talking to you 
The question for I have for you is what's your next step? For some of you on March 10th, it's growth track. For others of you, stop doing Christianity alone and get in a group. For others of you, it's time to sign up and go public with your faith in baptism. And the last step for many of you who call this place home, if I can just challenge you, when you meet Jesus, you give to him. Not because you're trying to go to heaven, because he died and you're going already. So I want to pray for the offering, which is an, an act of worship. In the same way that the tithe is an act of faith in your finances, the Sabbath is an act of faith in your calendar. Amen? So let me pray real quick for the, the offering this morning. Thank you, God, for your, for your salvation. God, we don't give because we want to be loved. We already are loved, Lord. And it takes faith, Lord, in the face of fear to trust you with our money, to trust you with our finances, God. God, we're so grateful for what you've given us. Every good and perfect gift, Lord, is from above. We're grateful, Lord. We love you. We praise you. And if you believe that, everybody...